Let us pray. Dear Lord, your ways can be hard to understand. Here we are in the midst of winter, bitter cold, a storm on the horizon, even a missing hour in the morning, and more uncertainties in our nation and world than we can begin to grasp. And yet, your promise to us shines through. We are thankful for the company of friends and family, the chance to make new friends here in your house of peace. Give us the vision to nurture one another here in this place. Fill our hearts with the hope we need to prepare the way towards your kingdom. Keep us strong as we meet the challenges of our community and world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, you may be um, pleased to note that the woman who can forget her name only forgot her glasses once this week and finally found them. We are in that phase of the capital campaign called visiting. But don't be alarmed. We are not morphing into Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> I had my visit, and I'm here to testify it was painless. <laughs> it was a very pleasant hour with Tom and Connie Green. They even met me at a neutral place in town, so I didn't have to, like, clean up for company. Because if I had to do that, I'd be in bed for two days. One subject of the many that we talked about was spending big money now in order to save even bigger money later. Just like in our own homes, when church is leaking dollar bills out the windows, I can just see it, and out the cracks that don't have insulation. We need to tighten that up because the savings in the long run will be enormous. So, looking down the road, enjoy your visit as much as I did. So I um, prepared the bulletin before having gone to Washington, D.C., so you're going to find there are quite a few changes, uh, inspirations, uh, adjustments. One is that, as you can see, France Robert is not here, um, but Andy is, and I thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure what that change was, but that's one. Another is that I was inspired, rather than to use the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, which had, I had thought to do all during Lent to kind of take us back to the roots the basics of our faith, that I found a version in Comanche, and I thought that that would be a, a nice way to begin our service today. So I'm about to play that, and that's what you're about to hear. And if you could treat it as a time of prayer, albeit in a language that is not one we uh, share. Nansuakai Ananya, Atequapa Pitoebe, 
siko sokova o tomova tu vaiku. Nami maata siko taeveni. Nami tusana nahina aik. Unami hanikata. Ketä aiku nami petsara. Saaku nami muille. Ojora na narmi. Mohaku nami kamakata. Nami sutai osu. Welcome. If you're new to the church, um, I'm Lisa Sparrow, the pastor. This is our second Sunday of Lent. Lent is a time where we go back to the basics of who we are as Christians, to the, sto the story of Jesus and his path toward crucifixion and resurrection. Today we focus on thirst and on water, one of our most basic needs. And I just welcome you all here today. Um, we have a few announcements. Uh, Fred's going to be first, and we have a couple more. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone who has already signed up for next week's strub, uh, Sugar on Snow Supper. <clears throat> anyway, um, there are still a few slots if you haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to um, sign up for food donations. The clipboards are in the back table working donation or working uh, slots are on the tree with sap buckets and all of that will be downstairs during coffee hour so um, i'll take them down after the service um, especially uh, needed are deviled egg makers and uh, a few uh, few slots at the uh, supper but i think um, i still have some conversations with people about that so we should be okay Next thing is to make sure we can fill three seatings. And uh, 7 o'clock needs the most work, so talk it up among your friends and neighbors and, and relations um, that 7 is a great time to have sugar on snow. Um, with 4 o'clock, 4.30 seating will probably um, sell out at this point. We're about three quarters full almost. And the, um, the middle seating is about half full right now. So. Um, calls are coming in, so thank you f to everyone who's helped uh, get the word out, and see you next week, or later this week. Yeah. Next week. This week. Yeah, that's a, that's a week away. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll have a we'll have a uh, special workshop on this and next when relating to Tom, <laughs> but later. I also want to just mention that we're moving into the 21st century. I'd like to think so at any rate. We actually have an event page on Facebook, which you can share. And uh, if you're a Facebook person, that really gets the word out. So help us with that, please. Thanks. All right. And Ellie, where are you? Yeah. Good morning. I'm Ellie Mayanen. And downstairs today after church, there will, I will be there, and perhaps Dunham will join me. I see him here. Um, the Community Collaborative for Guilford will just um, be downstairs for information for anyone. And that is the nonprofit that rose out of our vision committee and the conversations we've been having for at least three or four years um, about the project that might take place uh, on the property next door. So come down and see what we're doing. Thank you. So I see some beloved visitors today, some of which I recognize and some of which I don't. Um, Catherine, can I introduce you? I know it would mean a lot to people to know that this is Linda King's daughter, and she's here. So thank you so much for being with us. We love you, and we love Linda. Um, I also would like to ask a prayer petition. Uh, we have two or three young women, I'm not sure yet if Jessica's decided, who are beginning their confirmation process. So if Honey and uh, Ella, would you stand up? I don't know, Jessica, are you going to join us? Or, yeah. So anyway, they began today, and they will be working with me for the, through Lent. So if you could just send them some prayers uh, that they make it through this journey intact. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, any other announcements? All right, then how about birthdays? Anybody have a birthday this week? 
Yes, David. Yesterday it was our son Carlos' 20th birthday. All right. You made it through to the crest. Yeah, okay. Yes, Evan. Okay, cousin Mia turned 25. And Josh? Wow. Josh's mother uh, turned 49 yesterday. Yeah. And I know. Rosa and Krista. Yeah. Free! Tenth birthday, and she's here. Stand up and look like you're 10. <laughs> this is what 10 years old looks like. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Bill. Is she in spirit or in body? 105. Tomorrow, did you say? Yeah. Next Sunday. Wow. Yes. Sandy. Twenty-one, looking good. <laughs> All right, fifty-one. Uh, yes. Okay. Yesterday was Liz's birthday. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Dan. That's right. That's right. Elka's birthday was yesterday. Elka is a friend of ours who lives in Washington, D.C. Yes, Lily. <laughs> March 17th, you, you have a connection to that day? Yeah. All right, so Lily's having a birthday, too. That's great to know. Oh, I'm, okay. So, Elliot, so you won't be here, but we'll be singing to you, okay? All right. Can we sing? Now, before we light the candles, I would like to mention that we have the first, well, actually, the second of our Lenten series, but the first of our movie series today at four. Um, it didn't make ovation, so I'm ec making an extra plea. Alan Dater, who's, as you know, a well-known filmmaker, is with us at four today to watch a film that he made in the Holy Land with Johnny Cash. And the, the movie is full of great country music. Uh, this will be one of three movies, at, but today I'm particularly hoping people will come. The other movies, we'll watch them ourselves together, and if it's two of us or ten of us, it doesn't make a difference. But today, Alan Dater will be here in person, and I would love to have a few at four o'clock. So if a few people or many people could come, it's going to be a great movie, and he, it, I'm sure he has tales to tell of Johnny Cash in the 70s. So pretty neat. Anyway, so we're very lucky to have that happening. All right, so now, as these two young people light the candles that are the symbol of Christ's love and light that burns ever and always in our lives, let us pause and give thanks that we are here today with each other. Amen. As uh, we open ourselves to the worship hour, I would uh, invite you to take in the words of Psalm 42. I'm going to read uh, through chapter, through verse 5. 
As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Amen. And now, if we could sing together the opening hymn, number 394, I Have No Bucket and the Well is Deep. Please be seated. If you open your bulletins, you'll find a prayer of preparation that we can read together responsively. If you would read the bold after I read the normal font. In Christian tradition, the waters of baptism remind us of our connection to all things. We come from water and live in communion with plant, animal, earth, water, and air. Water is life. It purifies, quenches, cleans. It brings out renewal and transformation. Through baptism, water washes away all that is lies so that we might know our common ancestry and all that we live. We belong to each other. Water is life. Amen. Let us take time now in silence confession, and contemplation.
Go therefore among the nations. Remember that to baptize is to recognize the holiness of water. And teach yourselves that you can learn with others how Jesus walked on the earth with justice and compassion, with healing and with hope. He will be with you in each place where the need is great and you are full of fear. In the name of the creator of sacred earth, the spirit in all wind that blows, and his name born in the water of the womb, washed in death, risen in the river of life. Amen. We've made another small change in the program. We'll be singing by the river of Jordan.
Would the children please come forward? We have a special guest to tell the story today. So do any of you know who the first Vermonters before Vermont was even Vermont? And before ships sailed across? Who were the first Vermonters, Lila? The Abenaki. The Abenaki, the people of the dawn. So this is a story I learned from Joe Bruchak, who um, is of Abenaki uh, origin and descent, uh, lives over in the Hudson River Valley. Every culture has a creator some explanation for how everything got here. Blue Scabe made everything. Blue Scabe made the rich, fertile soil so that food, plants could all grow. Blue Scabe made the rivers and the lakes, filled them teeming with life. Blue Scabe made the forest, filled it with creatures of all kinds. Best of all, Gluskabe made the maple trees. Now in those days, things were different. You could go up to a maple tree and just reach up to any old twig. Reach up right now, kids. Reach up, find a twig, and you're just going to snap a twig. And right out of that broken twig would drip thick, sweet, sticky syrup. Life was good. <laughs> After a while, Gluskabe came to check on all that had been created and all that was good. Gluskabe went to the village to see how the people were doing, but when Gluskabe got to the village, the houses were empty. The doors were just swinging in the wind. It looked like no one had been there for a long time. Uskabe thought, I know, <laughs> silly me, they're out in the gardens, working in the gardens. So Gluskabe went out to the garden, but the weeds had grown tall and the tools were just thrown about. Gluskabe thought, I know, they must be down at the river, fishing and playing in the water. So Gluskabe went down to the river. But when Gluskabe got there, there was no one there. Gluskabe thought, I know. <laughs> Why didn't I think of this first? They must be in the forest, hunting and exploring. So Gluskabe went to the forest and began to walk all around, but could find no people until a strange sound seemed to be coming from under the bushes. And Gluskabe heard this sound. Ah. Can you make that sound? Ah. Very therapeutic. Gluskabe looked, and lying on the floor of the forest was a full-grown man. He was lying on his back underneath one of the maple trees. His mouth was open and there was a steady drip of maple syrup into his mouth. And Gluskabe could tell he'd been there for a long time because he had grown quite round. And Gluskabe looked about and there were other men and women and teenagers and children like you. Even the babies were lying on the ground, all of them under the broken twig of a maple tree. And they'd been there a long time because they had all grown quite round. And Gluskabe thought, this will not do. Can you say that? This will not do. So Gluskabe thought fast, went down to the river where there were some big, mighty birch trees, and cut the bark off the biggest of the birch trees, and formed a bucket that was bigger than this church, a giant bucket and went down to the Connecticut River and filled that mighty bucket with the waters of the river and carried that bucket up into the forest and slowly began to pour water into each of the maple trees. 
so much water that that thick syrup got thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until it just had the barest hint of sweetness to it, but it was pretty close to water. And one by one, the people looked up like something was wrong. And Gluskabi explained to them that things were going to be different. <laughs> they were going to need to make buckets, which was a task in and of itself, and seal them with pine tar. Then they were going to have to cut huge amounts of firewood and collect large rocks that they could pile on the huge bonfires until the rocks were burning red. And of course, they had to tap the trees and fill the buckets with the maple sap and haul the buckets and then take the hot, hot rocks and drop them into the sap until the sap boiled and the steam rose off and over and over and over again until the syrup slowly began to appear in the buckets. And on top of that, Muscabi made sure that all of this was only possible for a very short time every year at the very end of winter as a sign of hope that spring was on the way. And the rest of the time, the people could tend for their homes, work in the gardens, fish and play in the rivers and ponds, hunt and explore in the forest, and live their lives without the terrible distraction of maple syrup. <laughs> Gluskabe and the maple trees. Let us pray. Dear God, teach us to find balance, balance between what is sweet and what must be done. Lead us in our lives, now and forever. Amen. The scriptures this morning are Matthew 25, verse 34 to 40, and John, verse 1 to 14. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. John 4, 1 through 14. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone, who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, blessed Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So not knowing the story that Andy was going to tell, I had happened upon... Um, this little information about the mixing of communion water. And I, <laughs> I'm going to share it with you, but I have to say that there's something uh, grace-filled about the overlap of the story he just told with what I'm about to tell you. Um, I had run across an explanation of traditional um, communion. Uh, and that this still is true to this day in Catholic and Af and. Um, Orthodox churches, um, which involves the mixing of water and wine. 
uh, during communion. The explanation reads, when the water is mingled in the cup with wine, the people are made one with Christ, and the assembly of believers is associated and joined with him on whom it believes. When both are mingled and are joined with one another by a close union, there is completed a spiritual and heavenly sacrament. Thus the cup of the Lord is not water alone, nor wine alone, unless each be mingled with the other, just as, on the other hand, the body of the Lord cannot be flour alone, or water alone, unless both be united and joined together and compacted in the one mass of one bread. So this is, again, the story of mixing. And for, for um, Andy's story, it was the river, uh, the water of the river that mixed with the uh, people, uh, or the, the sap to bring us together as one in our work together. Um, I'm sure I could make more connections, but I can't think of them on the spot. But this idea of the mixing is what we're talking about today and how that happens. Um, at the heart of our beliefs about Jesus is that he was both human and divine. Even on the cross, in his last seven words, what we call words, which are actually phrases, uh, he said the words, I thirst. And we take those to be the most human of his statements. That was, he was a human being who was experiencing thirst, he was offered some vinegar, some wine at the time, and uh, sour wine, and he did not take it. He chose to be fully human at that moment. So here again we find this coming together of his humanity and his div divinity. At the well then, as we go to the story that Ben read so beautifully of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, we find a most human woman a Samaritan, a woman who we find out later in the story is an adulteress, meeting at the well. And it is she that offers Jesus water. It was not without some hesitance. Should she be the one to offer a Jew, a man, a person who was said to be divine, water? What role did she have? And yet he looked at her and we take this as one of the crucial stories in the Bible. He looked at her and saw her for what she could offer, for what she could do for him and what he could do for her. Again, a mixing. Um, he gave her the great gift of being able to serve him as she could and the capacity to be there for him. Uh, in that moment, she was, of both being seen and seeing, she had a turning point and a blessing. Her own humanity and her capacity for goodness was called out. She was the bucket and he was the water. And together they provided for the rest of the community from then on. She, her, she went on then to spread this word. Uh, he saw in her that capacity. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that same conundrum of who we are in our failings and in what we're able to give and to just take a few minutes to talk about the march where some of you know I was this week. Um, if you were here last Sunday, you heard a little bit more about it. I haven't really had a chance to process it completely, but um, I wanted to just tell you a couple of things which I think were treasures. I look to Derek and to Connie and to Peyton, who were there with me, um, to Chris Meyer and Pooja. We were all there, and uh, it was quite a profound experience for all of us, I think. Um, one of the most profound things was that Father Floberg was there. Now, Father Floberg is a man who was a priest, an Episcopal priest, for 25 years in a very small community of Cannonball, Cannonball North Dakota. There are about 600 people who live there all Native Americans, perhaps some that have intermarried. Very small, it's right on the Missouri River, looking over the bluff, 
the children have their school in such a way that they can see the river right where they are. Um, and he's been there for 25 years, and that cannot be easy, you can imagine. Um, it happened that God placed him right in the place that has become sort of this beacon for indigenous rights and climate justice. As he um, was living there, he saw, as people were gathering at Standing Rock, that this was, it was becoming more and more and more violent, and things were flaring up, the Army Corps of Engineers was accelerating its um, the, um, blasting of the water and some of the other things that they did. And so he called for us in November, he called for clergy to come and gather and pray and seek repentance for what the church had done and to become allies for the native peoples there. He told us, and I don't know how we managed to be where he was on Friday morning. This was as thousands were preparing for this march. He came to this small little church where the UCC people were gathered, and he talked to us. And I had already prepared the people, our little group for who he was. I consider him to be quite a hero. And somebody who, maybe like the woman, at, the Samaritan at the well, had been a normal person until something happened in the place where he was living that he was called forth to be a leader. So we all gathered, and as you've all heard through this story, we um, did a big act of reconciliation of all the grievances that the churches have done for, um, to Native Americans. And we offered ourselves up as, as allies. And he reported that in the weeks after, things calmed quite a bit down, that that moment was really important that the natives could see that we were allies and that the Army Corps of Engineers saw that there were people around the world watching this situation. So it became this sort of beacon. Now, fast forward, which I, of course, need to do. Uh, since then, two wonderful, one wonderful thing and one terrible thing. One wonderful thing was that they stopped construction of the pipeline through Christmas. And that was a day, you know, that was a great time. Now, of course, they're back building it. We won't get into the politics of that. And probably by tomorrow, um, oil will be running under the uh, Missouri River. So he said, he said that um, in, in some ways we could see what had happened as a failure, as a loss, and to some degree, of course, it is. But he also encouraged us to realize that now there was a transformation. Uh, he said, and I wanted to just offer this metaphor because it meant a lot to me at least, the, native, the Lakota tradition is that there would come a time when there would be a black serpent going under the Missouri River and that the head of that serpent need to, needed to be cut off. So people have been using that as a way of stopping the pipeline. And he said, but you know, I've grown up in North Dakota and if there's one thing you don't want to do with a black snake, it's fuss with its head. What you want to do is catch it by the tail and he offered to each of us that our job now was to take this story to wherever we were locally to consider how we could make it possible for fossil fuels to, to basically starve the snake, to, to live lives where oil and fossil fuels were no longer necessary so that the, the snake would die a natural death. And similarly, for us to not just think about the Standing Rock peoples, but for us to get to know the indigenous peoples wherever we are, and to embrace them and encourage the lifting up of their lives wherever we can, locally. So to me, that was a very important moment for him to offer us that way of transforming the story. It's important because again, with the water and the wine idea, the churches have been responsible for a lot of terrible deeds. I don't know if you know that Dartmouth College was originally started as a school where, where Anglican kids and Native kids would, would uh, go to school together. But as years went on, the Native children were let go and it became what it is today, a pretty amazing and elite school. So we have things for which we need to ask um, forgiveness. And yet, he said at the end that through this movement, 
the Native Americans now see the faith communities as somehow grafting onto the tree of life, which they believe in, and that the faith communities are now part of what they are holding up as that which uh, is pr making a promise to Mother Earth. Um, so then we had the march, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It was it was beautiful one day, and then the day of the actual march, it was as cold as it probably was in North Dakota for many days. It was sleeting, it was raining, it was cold, and we were a wash of people walking down the street. And my after, my, my feeling after, because we of course completed this march, and there were native, it was mostly Native American people from all over. Um, there were 28 states worth of UCC people, so if you think of Native Americans, that, representing even more. It was quite a representative group. And you could hear the drumbeat as we were marching, they would do some chanting, and we got to the end. And, you know, as we got to the end, the feeling was less about any one um, message. It was no longer a, about the pipeline, it was no longer about indigenous rights, it was about what happens when people of faith work together with people uh, who need support and of what we can do together. The, it, was, it, was a mar it was the women's march, it was the climate march, it was the indigenous march. It was what can happen when we come together and we do those things which God calls us to do. So that was a great gift and I just offer that to you as what our work is as Christians, is to really hold to the good and the right and to be who we are, where we are, to offer who we can to the person who we next meet. So that that would actually be about all I would have to say for today, but um, I wanted you to have a little bit of the flavor of our experience and um, of how much it is related to Christ's thirst and all of our thirst for justice. So let us pray. Dear God, We thank you for your support for all of us in Washington, D.C., and every day for all of us who pray for justice and mercy, that we remember we are one, that we see our moments of reconciliation everywhere and in everyone, trusting that Christ is within us, without, deep within us, and all about us that Christ is and always will be the water of life which feeds us and makes us whole. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the water of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people, Israel, from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. From this place and looking back through time in the history of our country and our peoples, we remember the rivers. Rivers have made us what we are and connect us. They bring communities together. They provide easy transportation and made early, <clears throat> early commerce possible. All our lives are bound together by these rivers. O oh God, creator of the waters above and the waters below, make us one body, like the body of rivers flowing together from many sources. Help us to remember that what happened to one part of the body affects all others. Help us to be mindful of the protection of our water systems as we are also mindful of protecting and standing with all parts of the body of Christ, your world, your people. Help us remember the oceans, how they brought a diversity of people to this country and met the first peoples here who showed them and continue to show us the way of the river in our land. We pray for the people who still cross oceans to find a safe home. May we be a people of welcoming, of sanctuary, of new possibilities and opportunities, and be gracious to share the abundance of our home. Help us remember the many, many people who live in urban communities and the water systems that make the cities possible, the water systems that provide for homes and offices and all the business and industrial uses of water. Help us never to forget our dependency on water systems. We pray too that we be mindful of using water responsibly and ethically and that really all the waters we use in, is water we actually just borrow. Help us remember the rural uses of water, water for farms, for irrigation, for crops, for animals, and to grow the food that supports all of our lives and the sweet ponds we depend on for recreation. In this place and time, as we stand and pray together, we pray especially for communities who do not yet have access to safe, reliable drinking water. We remember especially indig <coughs> indigenous communities who, for whom this is an ongoing struggle. We pray for our communities, our leaders, our own capacities to speak out. Creator God, who gives us the gift of the water above and the waters below, help us to ensure that all your children have access to good water. We pray that everyone's right to water will be heard and respected. May we remember the path that water takes as it circles through 
our bodies, and our lives. Let us remember, just like the water cycle, that what we put in is ultimately what we get back. Help us to live in ways that proclaim your glory together for the love of the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And with his words, we now join together. we make our morning offering, let us remember the Samaritan woman at the well. Her bucket was what she had to offer, and the water was for us all.
Our closing hymn is number 244. It's a change from your program. 244, like a tree beside the waters. May God bless you, may God keep you, peace, peace to Katina, peace to all of you, may God's face shine upon you and give you peace, now and forever, amen. Thank you.